grew up eating a lot of bubble gum when I was a child, so I loved did you know questions. Did you know that in 1978, the World Health Organization issued calls to member states for the inclusion of traditional medicine in primary health care systems? Did you also know that it was only 1981 in South Africa that parts of the practice of traditional healing were legal? And lastly, did you know that China has fewer people using traditional Chinese medicine in China than Africa does using African traditional medicine? In 1999, I began a journey into a world which is a parallel universe. That's all I can explain it as. When I began the process of Uktuasa. Now, Uktuasa is the process where someone who has the calling of Ubungoma, becoming a Sangoma, starts the journey with the teacher to actually get to the point where we are recognized as Isangoma as I am. It's a lifelong process, beginning from before birth and continues right through your life as a Sangoma. For me, the journey was interesting because my background and my identity was one of Christianity, and also I grew up in a colored, so-called colored environment in Natal. My mother, although Zulu, had always said to us that the reason she didn't marry a Zulu man is because Zulus had too many things. Um, she was very wrong, though, because she got hopelessly lost in her partner that she chose, my father. Because although born of a Zulu maiden and a white man, he was the most, and still is for me, the most traditional Zulu man I've known, partly because of his upbringing in rural Guamapumulo in Guazulu Natal. My maternal grandmother features very strongly in the dream visions I had um, leading up to my time of going to Ugutwasa. I'm told she couldn't follow her calling because she was married to a priest. My gr maternal grandfather was totally against my following this process of Ugutwasa. And I also hear that when he heard that Ngyotwasa, um, he asked them, what does she want? Ngendo yamakaba. Now, in, I, I struggled with that word, that it's the uncivilized and the unbelievers. Be that as it may, um, I continued my journey, which was very much intertwined with my mother's journey and her passing. My mother became very ill when I was about in my second year of university. And as I always say to people, it's interesting that in our culture, people usually remember that there's someone called a Sangoma when they've lost all hope and explored all other options that they can find, which is precisely what happened with her. She started going to consult Izangoma with her sisters, which to me was a sign of just how desperate things were. The one visit that she uh, actually told me about was to a lady in, um, in Howick, just outside Peter Maritzburg. She says that they were sitting, waiting in line, patiently. Those of you who've ever visited Isangoma know that patience is a virtue, because you don't know how long you're going to wait for your turn. As they were waiting, the lady walked out of her consulting rooms past them, stopped and turned and came back to them as they sat, and said to her, addressing her as a peer, asking Sangoma, what do you want from me? This was shocking to my mother because in her experience, she was no Sangoma. Uh, needless to say, they were quickly uh, taken into the lady's room and the consultation happened. Now, she's never relayed to me exactly what was said, but after that, there was an unprecedented function at my Anglican priest grandfather's house, where there was a traditional ritual performed on behalf of my mother, where she was accepting her calling and acknowledging it. She passed on relatively soon thereafter, but in my worldview, that was the better time of passing after she had acknowledged and accepted that this was her path. I was in university at the time when she was ill, and um, having stopped quite a few of extracurricular activities, I still held down a part-time job at the local cinema, and one day, feeling at my wit's end, I spoke to my colleague and said, my mother's ill, and they can't find out what is wrong with her. I have to add this, even though it's not in my script, that it was before the time where someone was sick and people automatically made assumptions about what it was. She then said to me, um, her mother's a Sangoma. Maybe we should go and see her. And this is precisely what we did. We went to see this woman, and it was my first experience of a Sangoma. And getting there, I'd never met her before, but there was something just familiar about her to my core. I felt as if I knew her. This woman, Uma Katini, who would eventually become one of my teachers, saw us, and after a very long consultation with her guides, 
said to us that we should go home and pray. That was her prescription. Now that was equally significant for me because my entire childhood, somehow I had assimilated a belief that Izangoma and prayer were anti each other. But here was this woman whose only prescription was to go home and pray. And that's in a few weeks, speaking to her subsequent to that, she said it's because she was told that my mother's time was up, which for me was another lesson which comes in with our practice in that although viewed as curative, we understand in African traditional healing that there's a point where it's time to let somebody go. Today, I find myself uh, as a Sangoma in a corporate environment and embedded in a society which I think is equally conflicted about me as I am about my role in society. For instance, if we get to a point where there are fully staffed clinics within walking distance of every village in the country, do I still have a role? Will I still exist? Is there still a need for me in the future? And yet, at the same time, we also have to grapple with things of regulation, with things of having to explain ourselves in a logical manner. How do I explain to someone how my body is a reflective mirror, that it's an antenna, that if you come and you are ill, I feel it in me. I, I don't have the words for it, but I know that it happens. How do I explain that I get taught through dreams and visions that you may not take seriously because that's not your perspective or paradigm about how knowledge is shared, but that's what happens. For me, knowledge is not a one-way and learning is not a one-way stream. It's multi-directional, multi-dimensional, across generations, across all kinds of cultures as well. Because a few years after my Uktuasa, I had a dream where three white ladies came to me and introduced themselves as being from my Derby lineage, who proceeded to teach me how to use a crystal to, uh, as, to diagnose as well as as a healing tool. How do you explain that in a logical manner? You can't, because we just don't have those words as yet. But at the same time, my day job, which is four days of the week, I'm placed in a situation where I'm dealing with regulations and coming up with regulations for traditional medicine, this very ancient practice, which is only now being unraveled and slightly understood, we are busy developing regulations for. And nowhere do I feel more conflicted and schizophrenic, frankly, than when I sit in those workshops and, and, and we're coming up with, with all of these standards. Because my question becomes, in the quest for this quality uh, health care, what are we doing? What are we doing to this ancient practice? And more importantly, when I return to all of those who have lent me this gift, because it doesn't belong to me, when I stand in front of them and they ask me, was this the best that you could do? What will my answer be? I don't know. Every day I don't know. It's something that haunts me. But at the same time, what choices do we have? What choices do me and all of the women and women who are in this corporate space, who are in 2015 paradigm, when it comes to how we handle our practices. In fact, the question that came was, am I part of being coll collaborating in my own extinction? I don't know. But that is, I think, the essence of being a traditional healer in, 21st, in the 21st century in South Africa, where I'm now seen as a, as a, as a, a protector and a preserver of a culture which was once very distant to me. And I have to assume that role and do it, I guess, to the best that I can. So when we are all over, because we are in corporates, we are in, in, in government, we are in industry, we are unemployed, we are employed across the entire spectrum, this is what we grapple with. We grapple with this modernity which has caught up with us, and yet we are still with our other foot in the ancient ways of being and they are in conflict with each other. And then I think maybe that's precisely why we are still here. We've survived despite incredible odds. We are still here, still thriving, and still living. And in conclusion, I'd like to pay homage to all those who are responsible for my being here, because without that permission, I wouldn't be here. I am Utapi. Ubonagel, into tagas gampu tungani nozandile. Umalugazani watabashi. 
o watu pagatwa ino zamini hamba hamba yosebenza upile ukule ukuzekbona galu kutisintu siapilis niyabona.